If I had a thousand tongues, I could not thank him enough. In the morning, I say thank you. In the new day, I say thank you. In the evening, I say thank you. No. 
I lay awake at night. 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 But that's all right. That's all right. Cause Jesus will fix it. Jesus, he will fix it. Jesus will fix it. Jesus, he will fix it. He picked it for my mother. He fixed it for you. Jesus, he will fix it. Oh, he fixed it for you. Jesus, he will fix it. I know he'll fix it. Jesus, he will fix it. I know he'll fix it. Jesus, he will fix it. After a while. Amen. Let's give the choir a hand. Amen. 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 Jesus will fix it. After a while. Whatever you're going through. The Lord has the power to help you move from problem to praise. Brothers and sisters, I, I don't know about you, but I understand music as a tool to help us move from the secular to the, to the divine. Music helps to unlock the door to the divine. And sometimes we have to just sing And God will make intercession for us. Brothers and sisters, uh, I'm not going to be before you long. But if you would allow me just a little time just to say a word, I'll preach to you and I'll get out of your way. If you would, turn with me to the book of Joshua. Firstly, before we do that, let us celebrate uh, our uh, new converts. Amen. Stand up, all three. Come on, y'all stand up. I know I'm putting you on the spot, but amen. All three of you, we bless God for all three. Amen. Amen. Two of these young people are um, Deacon, longtime Deacon uh, um, Collins, um, uh, Greg Collins, uh, Mark Collins, that's, that's Mark Collins. Uh, these are his great granddaughters, amen. Amen. Amen, we bless God for them. And we also bless God for this young man. Amen. We bless God for him. Amen. He's a child of the king. Amen. Amen. And I shared with you upstairs that African-American men uh, are endangered species. So to get a young man to come into the house of God and give his life to Jesus Christ is something to shout about. Amen. Let's go to Joshua 6. Joshua 6. I'm going to try to get out of here, get out of your hair. Joshua the 6th chapter. And if you are courteous enough, please stand. Amen. I know we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And when those cardinals about to play, amen, uh, we, we stand uh, and we pray uh, that you will also stand for the reverence of the reading of God's Word. Amen. Amen. We understand if you got a hip problem, a knee problem, or something that pre prevents you from standing. 
Um, but let's look at Joshua 6, chapter 1 through 5. And then we'll skip down to the 20th verse. It says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came. No one went out and no one came in. I'm reading from the New International Version. Then the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day, march around the city seven times uh, with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Somebody say loud shout. loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. We're going down to the 20th verse. It says, when the trumpet sounded, the army shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Amen. May God bless you. I want to use as a subject for today, meet me at the wall is going down. Meet me at the wall is going down. I know many of you perhaps are grinning and some of you are clueless. But for those of you who may not know what's going on, there was an artist by the name of Young Jock who created a song that said, meet me at the mall, it's going down. So to give you content for this context, I share with you that I'm preaching, meet me at the wall, it's going down. Touch your neighbor, say, it's about to go down. Dun, 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 dun. Uh, uh. On August 13th, 1961, the communist government of East Germany erected a barbed wire concrete barrier by which became known as the Berlin Wall. This wall was designated, this wall was designed and dedicated to separate East and West Berlin. And this is a place in Germany. In the dead of night, this wall was assembled and overnight families were separated and thousands of East Berliners lost their jobs in the West because of a wall. Y'all pray with me and walk with me. This is not a political message, but it's just a segue into the world of the text. 
the wall divided, the wall alienated uh, those who dared to cross the wall were shot on sight. By the end of its construction, it was 3.9 feet uh, wide, 12 feet tall, with 45,000 sections of concrete that weighed three tons each. It was 79 miles of fencing over 300 watchtowers, 250 guard dogs, 20 bunkers, 65 miles of anti-vehicle trenches. This wall did what it was intended to do. It divided. It is essential uh, for us to understand that the enemy does what it is intended to do. It is to divide. It is estimated that at least 171 people were killed trying to get over, under, or around the Berlin Wall. In June 1987, uh, I was a young boy, but I remember President Ronald Reagan gave a speech at the wall as he addressed the Soviet Union's Secretary of State, Mikhail Gorbachev, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. Two years later, East Berliners began to climb up the wall and to tear down the wall, and on October 30th, 1990, East and West Germany were officially reunited after nearly 30 years of separation and deportation and alienation. And if I could use my cerebral cinema, I can visualize and contextualize that the East Berliners were climbing up perhaps on the wall. They were saying, meet me on the wall. Y'all not praying with me today, I see. It's about to go down. <laughs> well, I'm going to preach by myself in here today. What I'm sharing with you is, brothers and sisters, no matter what has happened, I invite you today to meet me on the wall where Joshua is. Because I invite you to worship with me because it is about to go down. Walls of Jericho were a big hindrance to Israel. It stood as an obstacle between them and the promised land. Before they could go deeper into the land that the Lord had given them, the walls of Jericho had to be overcome and it had to be defeated. My brothers and sisters, there are some promises that God has for you. I'm talking to somebody today. There are some promises that God has for each one of us. There are some miracles that God wants to work in your life. But before you can access those miracles, before you can get to the promised land, there are some walls... that need to tumble. I'm talking to someone today. God, you are God's child. God wants to bless you. God wants to elevate you. God wants, you, God wants to put you at a place uh, where you've never seen before, but there are certain things that you must do in your personal life. There are some walls that need to fall. There are some barriers that need to tumble before God can put you where God wants you to be. There are some walls that have to come down. What's interesting to me about this text is that 
at the very beginning of the narrative, the writer indicates, if we look in our Bible, in, anybody got your Bible? I know many of us got our Bibles, many of us got a U version on our phones. As uh, long as you have the Word of God at your fingertips. What's interesting to me, if we look at verse 2, that God, what it says in the text is that God had already given Joshua and the children of Israel the land of Jericho and everything in it. I wish I can say that in 16 bars. God has already given you the land and everything in it. In other words, God has some provisions for you that he's already given you. But before the walls had ever come down, before any obstacles were ever overcome, before any complications were conquered, before any acreage was occupied, God had already given them the land. You ought to tell your neighbor, God has already given you the victory. Man, I'm about to sit down in a minute. But to me, as I look at this text, it has a Christological aroma. L let me visit the seasoned saints. The seasoned saints say to me, it says that God has already won. Somebody still ain't feeling me today. I'm glad to hear the season saints. They said the old account was settled a long time ago. You already have the victory in Jesus. God has already promised to you that you have what you need. So I want to share with you, God has already promised and provided our provisions. We must now prepare to possess God's land. God has already promised you. Are there any believers in here today? Don't you know that God has promised you some things? If you are a believer, God has promised you some things. If you don't believe me, where my Bible scholars at, go with me to the Word of God. God has already promised us something like security. God has already promised us our necessity. God has already promised us maturity. God has already promised us opportunity. God has already promised us possibility. God has already promised us ability. God has already promised us stability. God has already promised us vitality. And God has already promised us immortality. Somebody is saying, well, Reverend Letcher, I hear all of those big words, but take me to the text. I'm just about to get there so allow me to work toward the text Psalm 46 and 1 says God is our refuge and our strength of very present help in the time of trouble that security Philippians 4 and 19 says but my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus that's necessity second Second Peter 3 and 18 says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's maturity. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope for the future. That's opportunity. Jesus even said in Matthew 19 and 26, when men, with men it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. That's possibility. Acts 17 and 28 says, for in him we live, move, and have our what? Our being, brothers and sisters, that is stability uh, in Acts. 
Y'all, y'all need me to go on? <laughs> Brother and sister, Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and they, that may, they might have life more abundantly. That's vitality. John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. That's even more. That's him. More to, in other words, God has given you everything you need, but it's in the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you ought to start reading. You ought to hunt your neighbor. Say, neighbor, if you don't know the Word of God, you ought to start reading. If you don't have a commentary, you might need to go to Sunday school. You don't have a concordance, and you might need to be a Bible. All right, y'all, I'm, I'm, I'm about to get out of here. Nevertheless, as we prepare to possess God's promises, uh, these 27 verses of Joshua chapter 6 teach us how to make it go down. Anybody want it to go down? I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I want it to go down in my life. And, and to give you some spiritual understanding about what it means for it to go down, that means that the Lord is smiling on you. That means the Lord is walking with you. That means the Lord is leading you to where God wants you to be. The first thing that I see in the text is, in chapter 6, my brothers and sisters, as we peruse this particular pericope, we discover uh, the prerequisites of possessing God's promise. The first thing that God leads us to is that we have to have obedience to God's Word. Obedience. I remember Mama used to tell me something. I, I ain't know what it meant then. But I know now. She said, obedience. Come on, saints. Obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, God is calling us to a life of obedience. Look at the text. As soon as Joshua surrenders himself to the will of God, the Lord then reveals unto Joshua how to defeat the walls of Jericho. Obedience is one of the most important factors in the Christian life, so much so that God calls us to be obedient. Even though we don't understand what God is doing, we've got to be obedient. One scripture says, trust in the Lord with all, I'm about to shout by myself, with all, trust in the Lord with all. Where my Bible scholars at? Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge him, and God will. It may not be logical. Sometimes God leads us, and if we, uh, sometimes God leads us to a place that's not logical. Look at the text. Look at the text. God led them to a place where it wasn't logical. It, it wasn't logical. It wasn't logical, but God told them, hey, bring some horns. I'm glad we got all our preachers today. Get you some preach, get you some folks that can sing. And then we're gonna walk around the wall. What God had intended for God's people is for them to worship. 
See, folks was bringing sludge hammers. Y'all not praying with me today, eh? Somebody woke up and didn't eat their Wheaties. Look at the text. Soon as Joshua surrenders himself to the will of God, the Lord reveals unto him, uh, unto Joshua, how to defeat Jericho. He just wanted Joshua to do what he told him to do. That's why Joshua told the people as they marched, he said, be quiet. Sometimes we have to be quiet enough to hear what God is telling us. Because sometimes as we walk, we got those frivolous talks that festers fractious behavior. What I'm saying, sometimes if we just talking, just talking, we don't know what's going on. We don't know the direction that God is leaving us. Sometimes we'll just start talking. But that's why the Lord told Joshua, tell everybody to be quiet and let's just walk. And brothers and sisters, as a matter of fact, uh, there, are, uh, there are echoes uh, in the hallway of my divine mind's recollection. Samuel's witness as he responds to a religiously ritualistic song whose life were devoid of spiritual reality and allegiance to God. So Samuel asks, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as much as in obeying the Lord? Then he says, as mama rings in my consciousness, says obedience is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of the realms. Obedience to God is our only passport to victory. That reminds me of the old hymn that says, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I'm moving to my clothes. I might not tune today. I know this sounds good. It makes for praiseworthy preaching. It builds up for ecstatic ecclesiastical exegesis. It states and shapes up for a shouting showdown. But one thing I must share with you is that obedience to God is not always comfortable. Nor does it always provide the foreseeable. In other words, sometimes God might tell you to do something. You don't understand why God is telling you to do it, but you ought to trust him. It's not comfortable. Joshua, and I'm closing, I promise. I'm not one of those preachers that tell you I'm closing 15 times. I'm really closing. Joshua was a veteran soldier. Therefore, when God began to reveal to him God's plan, Joshua discovered that God had some strange plans. And every now and then in our life, God has strange plans. Uh, I want you to know today that uh, God, he had strange plans for Joshua's life. Joshua was a military genius. He was a leader uh, 
and he knew how to plan campaigns. He knew how to use spies in the life of Israel's military. And he had uh, some disciplined soldiers. Lord, uh, but God said uh, that this is not what I want you to do. I don't want you to talk about artillery or guns. But what I want you to do, I want you to put down your swords and put down your spears. But I have another plan that I want you, I want you to go by. There are no talks of sieges. There are no talks of strategies, of weapons, of mass destruction. But, oh, Lord, what the Lord tells Jeremiah, what the Lord, what the Lord tells Joshua is that you ought to keep on walking and you ought to keep on talking up the king's highway. Is there anybody here? that has been in a situation you didn't understand how God was going to move you but I'm so glad what the Bible tells me is that you ought to trust in the Lord with everything you have you ought to trust in the Lord with all that you got and he will lead you to where you need to be uh, if we look at the text God's plan it involved God's ark I want you to know this you ought to trust God wherever God is leading you Sometimes you don't understand what God is doing, but sometimes God has a divine design on your life. And you ought to lean on him. I, I, I'm just about done. But one songwriter says, I've learned to lean. I, I, know, I, I know I'm a lot further up north than uh, um, Hyde Park, uh, 38108. But my brothers and sisters, I think the same God that abides there is the same God that abides here. You ought to trust God. And you ought to meet him at your wall. Whatever your wall is, you ought to start walking. And God will knock your wall down. He said, bring some preachers. He said, bring some horns. And he said, you ought to keep on walking. Because one of these days, if you keep on walking, he's going to knock that wall down. I'm, I'm in here by myself today. Somebody might be struggling with an addiction. But you ought to keep on walking until you hear from the Lord. There's somebody in here that loves to gossip. You ought to keep on walking until the Lord knocks that wall down. There's somebody in here today that loves a 36, 24, 36. But you better keep on walking until the Lord knocks your wall down. Is there anybody in here that is facing a wall? You ought to keep on walking until the Lord knocks that wall down. I know that the Lord is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think he's able he's able I've seen God 
work. He raised a man from the dead. He gave a man sight. Is there anybody in here? He fed 3,000 with two loaves of bread. He fed them with a little bit of fish. And God is able to do what he said he do. He raised, he raised his son from the dead. And one Friday, he died on Calvary's cross. But early, early, one Sunday morning, he got up with all power. If you know that he's got power, you ought to tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The door is open. 